We want to welcome Louis Sorley, who's the author of the book, A Better War, The Unexamined Victories and the Final Tragedy of America's Last Years in Vietnam. Your book and the book by Gordon Goldstein, Lessons in Disaster, getting a lot of attention uh, over the last uh, week to 10 days. Has it surprised you? It's astonished me. The book was published 10 years ago, and for it to, to now be uh, given this attention is uh, really very surprising to me. Well, let me read to you uh, what uh, Peter Spiegel and Jonathan Weisman wrote this past week in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, again, pointing out that your book published in 1999, the book became a Bible to counterinsurgency experts in the debate over the Iraq War surge three years ago. Lieutenant General David Barno, who is the commander of the U.S. troops in Afghanistan until 2005, passed out the book to his staff, saying the first thing we did was tell people, read Louis Sorley's book. That's a uh, recollection from Bernard Champeau, who was then a subordinate to General Barno. That's, of course, very gratifying to an author, but uh, earlier on I had some contact with General David Petraeus. Uh, he had a, a tour of duty overseas, then he came back to Fort Leavenworth and he convened a conference there to write a new counterinsurgency manual that was going to be jointly published by the Army and the Marine Corps. And uh, I was invited to a conference that he, he convened to help him prepare for that. He said, okay, you and I are going to be the keynote speakers. You're going to look to the past and I'm going to look to the future. So, uh, so we did that. and. Uh, that was a point at which I think some of the lessons in A Better War began to be factored into current contemporary thinking. Well, let me get to the essence of your book. And this is based on a piece that you're going to have tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal. You write, all the better known early works on the Vietnam War concentrated disproportionately on the early period of American involvement, the years when General William Westmoreland commanded U.S. forces. William Colby once remarked that the prevalence of such truncated treatments of the Vietnam War was like what Americans would know about World War II if the histories of that conflict had stopped before Stalingrad, the invasion of North Africa, and Guadalcanal. Can you elaborate? Yes. Uh, the, the, probably the best known books about the war in the early period of writing about it were Stanley Carnow's book, uh, Neil Sheehan's book, and uh, George Herring, a very fine academician. And, and all those books were uh, uh, highly skewed to the first part of the war, the part, uh, especially 1965 when we put in major troop units, to 1968 when the Tet Offensive occurred. Soon after Tet, General Westmoreland was replaced by General, General Abrams. Uh, in Sheehan's book in particular, it's uh, 725 pages, I think, and only 60 pages are devoted to the period from after Tet to the end of the war, even though uh, the nominal subject of his book, John Paul Van, lived and worked in Vietnam for four more, four more years. So my contention has been that uh, far from being a homogeneous whole, as we consider it, many people consider it because of the unbalanced, I'll say, treatment in the early well-known books, it was a much different war in the latter years under Abrams and William Colby and Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, a better war, as I describe it. One other point from uh, this piece, again, which uh, you penned over the weekend, will appear tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal. When the last U.S. forces departed South Vietnam in March 1973, South Vietnam had a viable government and military structure that was positioned, had the U.S. kept its commitments, to sustain itself against renewed aggression from the North. When America defaulted, South Vietnam was doomed. We had made repeated commitments to the South Vietnamese uh, directly uh, from President Nixon to President Nguyen Van Thieu and through Ambassador Bunker and through other intermediaries such as Henry Kissinger that, uh, and these were largely designed to induce the South Vietnamese to sign on to the Paris Accords which theoretically would end the fighting that if the North Vietnamese violated the terms of the accord and renewed their aggression, we would reintroduce combat power to punish those, uh, uh, those renewed aggressions, probably thinking primarily of B-52s. Secondly, we said that if there were renewed fighting, we would replace on a one-for-one -one basis losses of major combat systems by the South Vietnamese, things like tanks, artillery pieces, aircraft, and that was provided for in the Paris Accords.
And thirdly, we said that we would maintain a robust level of financial support for the indefinite future. And, and in the event we defaulted on all three of those commitments, uh, a man named Tom Polgar was the CIA chief of station in, in Saigon at the, at the time. Uh, one of his last cables said, uh, outcome no, no longer in doubt, South Vietnam cannot survive without our support so long as North Vietnam continues to receive robust support from its communist backers. And that's what happened. As a lieutenant colonel retired, what's your background? Well, the lieutenant colonel retired is a long way in the background now. I served 20 years in the Army after graduating from West Point. I was an armor officer. I served in Germany, Vietnam, the United States. Um, I served several years at Central Intelligence Agency after that. I went to Johns Hopkins and uh, earned a doctorate in international affairs. But uh, beginning in about 1983, I, uh, I have been really living as a dinosaur in the period 1960, 1975, the, the period of the Vietnam War. I've written two biographies about people who were prominent uh, Army officers during that period, Creighton Abrams and another general named Harold K. Johnson. Um, for, I think I'm up to seven books now, but um, Vietnam continues to fascinate uh, me intellectually and emotionally as well. Well, let me, for the sake of the audience, because uh, the book did come out in 1999, it is uh, soon to be available in paperback. This is what the paperback edition looks like. You wrote, in Vietnam, Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, who you just talked about a moment ago, General Creighton A. Abrams, and Ambassador William Colby fought as hard as they could for as long as they could with everything that was left with them to try to win the war. Maybe others in Washington or elsewhere were interested in a stalemate or disengagement, but these three men and the forces they led were striving for just one thing, victory. And victory would... Um would consist of a South Vietnam able to sustain its independence and determine its own political uh, and cultural future. So that, uh, and that involved uh, building up South Vietnam's uh, uh, forces so that they progressively became more capable of uh, taking on the responsibility for their country's security. And uh, in the early part of the war, the, one of the major differences between the early and later parts is in the early part of the war, the emphasis was almost entirely on combat operations, ignoring uh, largely the improvement of South Vietnam's armed forces and ignoring the pacification of the enemy's infrastructure that was in the, in the hamlets and villages was keeping the South Vietnamese people under enemy domination. So uh, bunker and Abrams and Colby said this has got to be one war and they would capitalize that one one war a war not just of combat operations but also of upgrading South Vietnam's armed forces and of rooting out the covert infrastructure as we said at the top of our interview the other book getting a lot of attention is this one lessons in disaster McGeorge Bundy in the path to the war in Vietnam we talked this past week with the author Gordon Goldstein and he draws the analogy between Vietnam and Afghanistan Here's part of that interview. In Vietnam, we advocated a strategy of clear and hold. In Afghanistan, the strategy is clear, hold, and build. In Vietnam, we focused on the creation of what were called strategic hamlets for population protection. In Afghanistan, General McChrystal is advocating a strategy of population protection. Uh, in Vietnam, we decided that we needed to wage a classic strategy of counterinsurgency to win the so-called hearts and minds of the people. In Afghanistan today, uh, General McChrystal in his August 30 memoranda talks about winning the perceptions and the feelings and the allegiance of the Afghani people uh, to try to win uh, their support uh, to combat the insurgency there. Louis Sorley, your reaction to that comment? I, I watched Mr. Goldstein yesterday. I, I admired his uh, presentation very much. Uh, I, I can't help remarking that his book, like the others we spoke of earlier, deals with the early part of American involvement in, in Vietnam. You know, he, he takes as his major figure McGeorge Bundy. Uh, I, I find his book and mine more complementary than, uh, than antagonistic. Um, what we need to know uh, when, we, when we consider analogies to Afghanistan in the current instance is what was the real story of the other war that we're trying to 
make an analogy to or with. 